So, Eric, we're down to our last three books of the greatest biographies of all time. All right, so these are supposed to get better and better uh, as we go. Yeah, and I, I don't know how... I mean, the books that we've covered thus far are, are pretty... I mean, they are doozies. Yes, they are. But these next three books... Are doozy doozies? I think they are double doozies. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't think we had much argument on these three books. I mean, yeah. I think all three of these rose to the top of our... Okay, out of all the ones that we were choosing, we were just trying to figure out the order... Uh, but the one that we're talking about today is Evidence Not Seen by Darlene Dibler Rose. It is such a tremendous book. Do you want to talk a little bit about just the quick overview yeah. of the story itself? This could easily, without argument, I mean, it's, it's, you just silence anyone who would come against this book to say this could be the greatest biography ever written. Now, the fact that we're putting two above it <laughs> shows tremendous value in those two, and they really are e extraordinary. But this is a masterpiece in every regard. This lady is so precious. And what she went through was so difficult. But uh, she's just, as a young, newly wedded uh, wife, heads to Papua New Guinea with her husband, Russell. And it's right before the beginnings of World War II when the Japanese are going to swing into uh, that region of the world and take those islands. And there she is caught in the midst of it. And she's going to end up going through ex not just suffering, but very extreme suffering. We're talking concentration camp sort of suffering and also death row where she's in solitary confinement. She's going to have extreme uh, physical ailments and somewhat of a spoiler alert. Her husband is actually going to die in the process. Her, who she was just, who was young and robust and just married uh, to him. And so, the travesty, the tragedy, the trauma is so high. And I think that's part of why the book is so powerful. Is it's not the absence of difficulty; it's the presence of something in the midst of the difficulty which stands out to everyone who reads this book. God was there in the midst of the darkest hour. And what he does in and through this woman in those situations is profound and it's worth reading. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it is so breathtaking and, and even just the impact. Um, I, I read it because you and Leslie are always talking about it. Mm -hmm. And so it was, it was a few years ago, we read it for, I think our, our, our alumni uh, book discussion. And I was so just deeply moved and stirred um, a lot of just because of what you said, but just seeing that triumph and that smile. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll, at least I'll just start with the impact thing. I, I love this idea that here's a woman who has this overwhelming faith, confidence, trust, and just even a simplistic joy or hope in her God, regardless of circumstances. So as things kept getting darker and darker, you know, it's like you would naturally just want to despair and, and fall onto the ground. And yet you see this woman just say, Lord, I don't, I may not understand, but I trust you. And you just see her triumph in this, this reality. And, and it's such a sad picture to compare like her experience with like, the church during the last couple of years. Because mm -hmm. you see the church, you know, we really have not had it that tough. Mm -hmm. You know, COVID really wasn't that bad. And yet you see the meltdown of society. Yeah. And yet you see someone who's enduring incredible difficulty yeah. and yet triumphing. Yeah. Uh, what would you say is the big impact for you in this book? Yeah, it's there's a lot of layers to this. Again, just like some of the previous books where it's just like, ah, it's a, it has had a huge impact on Leslie and I, our marriage, our family, our ministry. Which, by the way, I think this is probably a good way of saying it. This is one of those books that you need to read multiple times. Oh, yeah. This is not like a one read. Actually, I think all the biographies we're talking yeah. about. But this one in particular, mm -hmm. there is so many layers that you need to read it multiple times just to pick up some of those nuances. And as a, an aside even, we I, I went through a series called Daring to Do with Stanley Dale. That was last, it was a year ago, a year ago this fall. And it's a, what was that, 24 part series? I, I can't even remember how, how long that <laughs> one was. But one of the sub themes, I had Leslie show up, I think every like Friday for a few weeks. And she was going on a sub theme because it was about basically the missionary venture to Papua New Guinea. And Leslie covered Darlene Dibler and Russell Dibler, that portion. And she had all sorts of audio clips from her. If you would like to get to know Darlene, those are great messages. So that you could find them, just the Leslie episodes in that series. That's right. That whole series was really good. But I do think most people said Leslie's sessions were probably their favorites. Yeah. I, not not to downplay I, yours. but Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I accept it. I accept it. Since we're married, then I get to share in that because we're one. Oh, that right? would make so sense. So when you compliment Leslie, I feel like it's somehow It's yours to too. Me. Yeah, right. it's mine. Well done, Eric. Those <laughs> sessions of yours were amazing. <laughs> So uh, 
my there there's a there's a moment where she's in solitary confinement on death row. Okay, <laughs> not a very easy situation. Her body is swollen up. She's sickly. She can hardly function. She's had not. She hasn't had a normal meal. I mean, she's had, you know, gruel with you know things crawling in it type of food, and she's rejoicing. She's worshiping, but she's getting to that point where she's breaking down spiritually, even and. In that moment, uh, she she climbed up the side of her wall, and she has like this little you know peak hole outside, and she could see some bananas out there, and boy did she crave bananas! And she prays a prayer, but it was sort of like as she always described it, sort of a pitiful prayer, you know, like God, I I really want bananas, but she's also thinking, how could God ever get bananas to me in solitary confinement on death row? It's just not going to happen. But she really craved bananas. And she has this fellowship with her father in heaven, which is so beautiful. And I would say it's sort of that Corey Ten Boom-esque thing where when you read Darlene Dyler, hear her speak, it's similar to a Corey Ten Boom where you just have such a deep affection and, and care and love for this, this woman. And, uh, but the story, I don't want to give it away, but the story is so profound. And how many bananas, do you remember how many bananas she had? Oh, I don't remember the number. But it was like it was 90, you know, some odd bananas get delivered to her cell through the strangest, most bewildering means, uh, from an, the guy who was over the concentration camp she was in, who she shared the gospel with. And he had the ability to somehow give her a gift and so he had bananas delivered to her in her cell after she praised this prayer. And it is so remarkable to me to see, in a sense, how God, even in my own life, has given me bananas in the darkest moments, that he shows his presence and gives a buoying grace. The Bible calls it a consolation that actually outpaces the pain. And it's actually greater if, if, if God were to say, hey, Eric, I could take away the pain. And they're like, oh, could you? But then you don't get the bananas. Then I would say, well, God, all right, I accept the pain because the bananas are so good. And that's a real huge impact point, I think, for my soul as I went through this book. Mm, that's so good. Yeah, I, I think one of the characteristics that I really love about Darlene is, is just her simple childlike faith, but it's that her leaning upon the strong arm of her Lord um, every step of the way. Because uh, there, there is so many unknowns in her life and so many difficulties and yet you just see her tapping into that reservoir of grace that the Lord has. And even though it's not easy, you see her shine mm -hmm. in a very powerful, powerful way. Yeah. Any any key traits? I mean, I, there's so much. So you yeah. could talk about her life very specifically, but anything that really stands out in terms oh, of yeah. like a highlighter? Uh, the ever rejoicing soul is, I think, what I wrote down to describe it. No matter what it is, no matter what the weight, no matter what the challenge, even if it's tears through tears, She's going up, not down. The depression, the despair, the discouragement was just constant in her life. And she is always praising. She's always worshiping. She's always thanking God. She's always rejoicing. And whatever that is, I want to bottle it. And I want the fullest measure of it. I want everyone you know that I know to taste whatever she has. This is true Christianity in the darkest hours when it's shown. And so that is the, the key trait that is so uh, dynamic in and through her. I really love this book. And again, I think it needs to be on everyone's reading list, not just once, but yeah. you and Leslie read this what, almost every year. Oh, yeah. I mean, last year we were doing Daring to Do a Stanley Dow. I probably went through some of this stuff multiple times just in one year. But yeah, it's it's usually at least once a year that mm -hmm. we'll go through that. That's so good. Well, even just in closing, would you mind even praying a prayer mm -hmm. for all those who are listening, just that we would, the very thing that she emulates you know, we, we look at where culture is going and it's it's not a very happy place, yeah. it seems like. Yeah. And yet we need what she had, which is the grace of the Lord. Would yeah. you just pray, uh, even just as a, almost as a means of keeping our focus on Jesus and mm -hmm. and reminding us not to, to wallow in the self-pity, but rather to to trust and, and walk by faith and grace? Father, we ask for that grace in difficulty. We ask for the ability to see that beauty always comes out of ash, that you are a God of redemption and our Redeemer lives. Lord, we ask that you would build your church into a triumphant picture that demonstrates in this natural realm who you are, your victory, your triumph, and that all things are beneath your feet. Lord, you have won the victory. You are the champion. 
And I pray, Lord Jesus, that we as the church would show that. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.